Welcome to the Next Gen CMO Podcast, where we sit down with seasoned CMOs and emerging talents in sales and marketing to explore the wins and occasional losses that shape today's leaders and the strategic maneuvers that can help propel you to the forefront of B2B marketing. All right, everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Next Gen CMO Podcast. Today, I am thrilled to welcome um, one of my, our first internal guests, um, Gareth Noonan. He's the GM of advertising at Demandbase. And um, so we're thrilled to have him. Welcome, Gareth. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Good to be here. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, the reason we're excited to have Gareth is we're going to be talking about advertising and really what advertising looks like in 2024, 2025, and what we're going through. And Gareth is an excellent guest because he's just a veteran of, uh, of programmatic uh, ad tech. He's been in it for 15 plus years. He's led GM roles across, you know, tech platforms, SSPs, Rhythm One, Smato. He's got a bunch of ad tech and MarTech background combined together um, using ABM best practices. And so super excited to see how he thinks about programmatic B2B, media spend, campaign optimizations, and how it all fits into account base. So let's dive in. Uh, this week, Demandbase is launching their second annual State of B2B Advertising Report. Uh, this is uh, exciting because it's a great way to use um, a lot of the data, a lot of the insights, a lot of things that we see across all of our customer base and across the whole market to help inform folks on how uh, how adver advertising is evolving. As we know, this this industry changes daily, weekly, monthly, and so keeping up with it is is quite a feat. So for the listeners who haven't heard about this report, tell us a little bit of uh, more of an overview of what's in that report, why it's important, how it can help. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the report surveyed over 150 customers. Um, and we also got the input of both internal and external industry experts. Um, and when we look at the, the, the content within, I mean, obviously, there's what are the trends that everybody is moving towards in the industry? There is, you know, appropriate anonymized campaign data uh, across all of demand bases advertisers that give us, uh, you know, good insights to not just how trends are being adopted, um, but, you know, the general sort of evolution of best practices. So the objective of the report, obviously, is not just to provide that that overview, but also to be quite actionable. And, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of what the team has produced and um, are, are happy that, um, you know, like I said, it is actionable. You know, it's going to give everybody a pretty good sense of what's been happening this year, but obviously, more importantly, what's coming in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love the way you said that, because I think of that a lot as our demand-based value prop, that data without action is sort of a waste of time. So if you can take that data and actually use it uh, to affect the way that you go to market, uh, it's pretty powerful. Well, cool. Well, there's a bunch of things that came out of the report. You know, a lot of things on industry shifts, things that are happening in customer buying behaviors, changes in privacy, economic challenges, all the things. So let's dive into a few of those. A couple that came to the top, no surprise at all, power of AI, personalization. Um, these are themes we hear a lot and people have certain expectations now. I mean, the market has gotten so smart. Customers are, are so much more savvy on responding to ads and knowing what to look for. So they sort of have some expectations in that area. So starting with the power of AI, it concluded that marketers can't survive without AI automation and that volumes demand it because the volume is so significant that without doing that, um, without that automation, it becomes too, too, too burly to handle. So what do you think about this? You know, as the, the AI theme emerged in recent years, certainly in the, the scope of advertising, one of the areas that everybody assumed, um, you know, would be most impacted and maybe early impacted was creative. Um, and the dynamic generation of creatives, um, you know, to address the, the customer use case at the right time, the right place, the right user, all of those things. Uh, so that's definitely a trend and, and a need and a, an interest that came across pretty clearly in the report. Uh, and then also, you know, I think the, the evolution of campaign targeting and measurement on more of a, an AI basis, uh, you know, rather than very much sort of a hands on the control, uh, you know, more kind of trusting the machine to understand, you know, what are your budgets, what are your KPIs, and then optimizing campaigns to deliver those outcomes. And look, needless to say, we're not there today. Uh, nobody is. That's going to be a work in progress. Um, you know, I think it's often said with new technologies that we probably overestimate them in the near term and underestimate them in the long term. And so it is going to be an evolution over the next few years. But, you know, one thing that's clear, and I think came across from customer responses, and there's certainly our view of the world as well, is that the volume, the quality and the quantity of data needless to say that goes into training these models to perform the next best action to optimize your campaign 
uh, you know, all of those things is obviously key. Uh, and, you know, as a, but for what we do on the space and for the amount of data that Demandbase has access to both our customers' first party data and our third party data of, uh, assets, you know, we're pretty confident that we're in a good place to address this. And it's, it's obviously a direction that, you know, the Googles with Pmax, uh, you know, Meta with Facebook Advantage Plus and more recently LinkedIn with Accelerate are all moving into is these um, these automated campaign outcomes. Yeah, I mean I think I think that's that's exactly right. I think the, I think people even can't wrap their minds around the full universe that is AI, right? It's not the simple gen AI, it's automation all the way through that that process. It's automating this repeatable workflows. You know, we talk about agents sometimes, so the whole concept of of using AI through every step of that process. But I keep hearing, I'll hear folks Usually it's when I'm talking to prospects who are still on the fence about whether or not they're ready for account based. And I feel like there's this, there's, and maybe it's a startup y thing, maybe it's a, a mid market, maybe it's a budget thing, maybe it's an economy thing. But I hear some trends around kind of DIY ABM, kind of this idea of like, well, if I have some data and, um, and it's been, and I can derive some insights from it, then I could probably manually just run my own and kind of build my own little self-made ABM solution. I can buy some kind of off-the-shelf AI solution, buy some data and kind of do it myself. Have you seen any success or failure on that or where? I mean, what ends up, usually what comes back is the data accuracy is what falls apart um, because it doesn't have that sort of overlay of of an account-based filter, the volume, the massive amounts of volumes that you're talking about that are training and informing that AI model. Um, but I'd love to hear uh, if you've seen any, any threads of, uh, of credibility in that line. Well, it's interesting when you mentioned the, you know, the trust in data, the quality of data, 50% of respondents said that that is one of the biggest challenges that they face in adopting and, um, and activating uh, an account-based strategy. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, look, this has been our philosophy, obviously, over the years, you know, the right blend of personalization, customization, but also automation within a platform. Um, so that, look, realistically, you always have users with different levels of sophistication, different levels of internal resources. And some, you know, are very much lean into the managed service and trust the technology, uh, whereas others, you know, really, based on their own individual use case, want much more customization. But what's emerging with the AI theme is, you know, as you mentioned, the, the agentic um, AI, where it's, uh, you know, basically describing and prompts what it is that we're looking to do or the insights we're looking to drive. Uh, and then, you know, the technology will either, um, you know, create those those activations or will pull out those insights. That's definitely a lot of people are leading into that. And, you know, a lot of when you look at the like how to put a context behind the, the, the evolution of AI and the adoption of it and like what can happen in the near term. I think a lot of people have really leaned into that agent concept and we're seeing it with like, you know, automated SDR technology. Um, you know, we're seeing it with the, the kind of campaign automations that I mentioned with some of the creative automations that I mentioned, and then just through the UIs that we all work with every day and chat GPT and Claude and, you know, perplexity, et cetera. So yeah, clearly a theme that came across in the report and needless to say, you know, when you look at the, the roadmap that demand base and a lot of other folks in the MarTech space are working on, and you look at the demos of Dreamforce, you look at the demos that are happening at a lot of big agency conferences, it's a core, core theme. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We just even signed on with Jasper in our, our sort of in our marketing organization, how content creative campaigns, even competitive intelligence, all the things can kind of be used there. And it comes with sort of 50 prepackaged workflows, um, very similar to this, you know, agentic AI concept. And I love that concept. I think that phrasing is going to become much more mainstream. I still stumble through it, agentic, um, but I get the idea that it's um, AI through agents. Um, but I think the uh, the concept is super powerful. So, so that's awesome. Very cool. I'm excited to um, to work in Jasper as well. It's um, you know everything I've heard is that it's a great tool. Yeah, we did a pretty robust RFP across a few different solutions, and I think we're excited. We're going to test it out with a few seats and see how it goes. So I think um, I think that is proof plus demand base plus some of these other AI things that you see is that AI where I feel like when it started, not started, but the last few years when it sort of hit this kind of, you know, mainstream adoption was more about cost savings, right? It was about efficiency. It was about doing things faster so that you could cut costs. Now it's shifted so much to a profit center, right? A way of actually driving revenue, accelerating revenue, getting to the right target faster. Still in that same vein of sort of cutting out extraneous costs and, and time, but with the idea of accelerating uh, top line instead of cutting the bottom, which I think is uh, is pretty pretty powerful and a much better investment idea. 
Yeah. I mean, that's a growth mindset, right? It's not about replacing capabilities. It's about expanding capabilities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And freeing up minds to do more innovation things while you can kind of standardize um, repeatable tasks. Well, cool. Well, the other big trend that came out of this report was around personalization. So I think buyers just expect it now. They know that the market is smart enough to be able to spe- to to personalize message to them. It's crowded. They want personalized experiences, not just a nice to have anymore. So where, what did you what did you see? What showed as sort of a, a shift or a progress around personalization in this uh, state of B two B advertising report? So it wasn't a surprise to see that seventy three percent of marketers in the the reports responded that personalization at scale was something that was top of mind for them and. You know, it's very validating, obviously, when you see that your your customers, your partners, your sort of, um, you know, other people in the ecosystem are thinking the same way as you are, um, you know, especially when it comes to advertising personalization by journey stage, needless to say, is incredibly important. Um, you know, we always advocate that for a sort of, you know, more kind of brand and awareness. It's about, you know, quite generic content. It tends to be sort of like blogs and web pages. And then as you move down the funnel, you increase the value and maybe increase the, the the right as well to ask for some customer information, you know, simple kind of low lift forums, those sorts of things. And personalization is needless to say the give and the get um, that really gives a user uh, that sort of confidence. And, um, you know, so much obviously of the buyer journey happens anonymously and so much of the is controlled by the, the buyer these days that you have to create that trust and give them a reason to kind of raise their hand. And personalization is absolutely a key tool in that. And even when it comes to the economics, like not surprisingly, you know, there's McKinsey data that shows that, um, you know, effective ad personalization can cut acquisition costs by 50%, boost revenue and increase marketing efficiency. Uh, you know, all of these things make sense, but it's good to measure it as well. Um, and, you know, what you mentioned with with tools like Jasper, uh, they're only going to accelerate and further enable this kind of personalization. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we see a lot of these sort of technologies and these use cases emerge in, in the B2C world first, if only because when you look at digital spend, 90% of it is, is B2C. Um, and so, you know, the, the budgets and the R&D capabilities there tend to be considerable. And, you know, we've seen this in e-commerce for quite a few years, and it's getting even more granular around like understanding what your buyer behavior is, uh, and then, you know, customizing the offer, customizing uh, the creative, customizing the, the, you know, the version of the product, all of these things. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that we can learn in B2B, but I think people have, uh, I'm already seeing it adopted uh, in terms of, you know, dynamic look and feel for like a thin serve prospect, for example, uh, versus for more of a kind of, you know, high tech, maybe <clears throat> company, you know, with a different persona and a different kind of buying group, conservative versus a bit more edgy, those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do think it's one of the areas that we are going to see the quickest adoption in and, uh, you know, the most effective playbooks over the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that sort of customized look and feel or segmentation you talked about with, um, with like say Fencer versus healthcare versus high tech, whatever it happens to be, I think is so powerful because I think with AI, we're able to do that personalization at scale in such a different way. Whereas it used to be really this one-to-one or one-to-few kind of a space. That's how account base started. And all of a sudden now with all this AI advancement, we're now talking about one-to-many at scale and ABM becomes a replacement for a demand gen, like a broad demand gen motion. Instead of it you see, you had to kind of run it in parallel, right? I got to cover all my trenches with demand with with regular demand gen. And then I'll you I'll layer sort of ABM on top for like the key accounts. Now it's like, no, 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 I can actually do it at scale across my entire demand gen model. And I think that's such a game changer. Yeah. And just think of the, you know, the testing and optimization efficiencies of like as you described, you know, not that long ago you would have a creative team. Uh, and maybe an analytics team that was, okay, well, let's test the placement of this element in the ad. Let's test this color palette. Let's test this call to action. Um, and, you know, that just doesn't scale. And now being able to, you know, potentially roll out hundreds or, or you know, even more combinations and really seeing what's moving the needle. Because at the end of the day, a lot of this is about incrementality. No one change is going to lead to a 10% increase in performance. Uh, and so locking in that incrementality. Um, is, uh, you know, one of the near term promises of um, dynamic creative optimization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's that's pretty powerful. But the trade off potentially is, uh, is are there privacy concerns when you think about personalization, right? If someone if I'm getting an ad to me to my 
email, to my computer, to my text, to my cell phone, um, to my Facebook instance or my LinkedIn or, or I don't know, wherever it is, is there concern that there is a lack of privacy or a lack of, of data, data protections out there um, when, when done in concert with virtualization? So, you know, it's interesting, Kelly. I think in some ways this is the original sin of digital media is that we have not, as an industry, done a good job of explaining to users the trade-off, the value exchange of personalized advertising for free access to quality content. And so when we hear the, um, you know, the privacy and the regulatory conversations in recent years and user concerns around particularly third-party cookie tracking, which, as we know, was eliminated in Safari a number of years ago, and even though Google has gone through various versions of how they're going to approach it, it does look like they've landed on the right one, which is user choice, which is coming next year, where Chrome users are going to be given options to, to opt into certain, you know, different versions of targeting and measurement. But, the, you know, there seems to be a lot more concern on the open web for users about this than maybe there is in wall gardens, where people are, you know, in their personal capacity seem to be willing to share, you know, all kinds of personal information that then obviously is used for content targeting and ad targeting. Um, but, you know, I wish we'd done a better job of communicating that to, you know, non-technical users, people who don't live in this world day to day, that the reason uh, you are seeing personalized advertising, and hopefully it is personalized, but that's the trade-off, is because that is how quality content is paid for uh, on the open web. And I do worry that as a lot of that signal loss and that ability to understand, you know, what has this user been reading and researching? What are their interests? Uh, what advertisements have they seen previously and what have they reacted to? And, you know, the personalization and the targeting and the relevance and everything that comes with that. As that goes away, I do worry that, you know, opinions about advertising are only going to get increasingly hardened. Uh, so I think it's on us as an industry to make sure that some of the signals we have today are replaced with new privacy safe ones. And needless to say, that's something that, you know, we at Demandbase have been working on for, for many, many years and are very confident in the internal and external technologies that we're deploying there. Um, but there's a storytelling aspect to it too. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I expect it in consumer, right? Like I know that if I go to Nordstrom.com and look at a pair of boots, those boots are going to follow me. Like when I read an article on USA Today, there's gonna, those boots are going to be down the sidelines. They're going to show up as a feed in my Instagram. They're going to show up all over the place. I expect that in consumer. The B2B side, we sort of, I don't know, somehow feel like that privacy should be walled off a little bit. Like somehow that shouldn't follow me. Um, but the reality is like it does, right? That's that um, that's that programmatic uh, arena that we play in is that it's sort of a 360 marketing that does kind of show up in the walled gardens, but also outside and through email and through articles and news and everything else. So it's uh, it's definitely something that I think you're right. We've probably done a disservice to the industry um, from the beginning on just education and knowledge on that. There's lots of information we sort of accept through things without actually uh, understanding it, right? I just accept all because I want to get to my content, um, but there's really great explanations out there. But you brought up the concept of walled garden. So I do want to dive in a little bit on some of the learnings you saw in that. So so from this report, I saw that 85% of marketers surveyed are spending the majority of their ad dollars on LinkedIn. But they also said that when they pair those LinkedIn dollars with display ads, that they're seeing 50% more clicks, 33% less cost per click compared to running just LinkedIn alone. So where are you, what are you seeing as sort of those trends, that social media, like what do you think of the LinkedIn impact on this whole business, especially in the, obviously in the B2B space, but that combination with display, where do you, where's that coming from? It, it really is um, a story of better together, Kelly. And that is a story that we, in a consultative fashion and partnering with our customers, have been telling for a long time. Um, that it's never about any one channel. It really is about understanding how channels can complement each other. And then in a testing capacity, sort of looking, you know, dialing one up versus the other and seeing the overall incremental impact. You know, if you combine account-based display on the open web um, with similar audiences, with similar creatives by journey stage, et cetera, you will see uh, increased efficiencies in your LinkedIn spend. You will see increased efficiencies in your AdWords spend and even in your content syndication. And, and it's, it's not surprising, um, you know, because you are surrounding the user uh, with consistent and relevant messaging. Um, and obviously, you know, there are different environments and there are different contexts across those different channels in which you can deliver that messaging. And then, you know, the, the LinkedIn data obviously doesn't surprise us. It's, you know, eMarketer estimates that LinkedIn has uh, about 40% of the display market 
uh, in B2B at about 20% of overall spend um, because, you know, obviously search is a huge part. Search and display are basically the two main categories. Um, and LinkedIn also is the only wall garden that has any concept of account based, you know, where people do tend to declare the company that they um, work for or have worked for in the past. And so it is, um, it's a channel that we complement very well. And there's data in the reports that I would definitely encourage people to, um, to take a look at where, you know, we share the, the impact of our internal campaigns. And we have, you know, some incredible internal program managers who are talking to customers and prospects in the industry generally about this all the time. You know, we're never going to be uh, so egotistical as to say it's all about demand-based advertising. Uh, it really is a bit better together. Awesome. Yeah, I've seen that enough in, in customer meetings uh, showing that kind of ROI of like, this is what it was alone. And then when you added demand-based layouts on top of that, you saw this sort of exponential uh, impact, which I think is uh, is pretty powerful. So, um, so that's great. So speaking of LinkedIn... Um, we are seeing this, uh, and whether people know it, it's sort of this sneaky little, you know, I don't know, rabbit coming in the back door, like that we don't even realize we're we're getting marketed to, but is this sort of rise of influencer, right? Influencer used to be consumer. I used to just always expect, I used to be a big, um, don't hold this against me, I'm not anymore, but I used to be a big like Bachelor and Bachelorette fan. And what you always knew is at the end of the season, all the like kind of stars from the Bachelor or Bachelorette would kind of get a new careers influencers on Instagram promoting some great new pair of jeans or some great new fragrance or whatever else. And they were kind of, they slid into your uh, your feed very slyly and you didn't even realize that you were uh, being influenced too. Well, now that's happening, obviously, in the B2B space. You see the the Vin Matanos and the Morgan Ingrams and the, you know, Devin Reeds of the world out there as as key, especially for marketing and sales. But I know there's there's influencers across every industry. So what do you think about this trend? And what is did we see that show up in this B2B advertising report? We did. It's um it, it's extremely interesting. And, you know, I mean there's a lot of supporting data around this um that suggests this is going to be, you know, a, a twenty plus billion dollar industry um by the end of twenty twenty four, which you know, as you're starting to sit up and pay attention to the trend to hear those numbers is kind of mind boggling. But in some ways, it's not surprising. Like when you think about the evolution of buyer controlled um, journeys, um, you know, so much of the journey happens anonymously, you know, quote unquote, in the dark, um, before uh, the buyer kind of like formally raises their hand and, and you know, identifies themselves or, uh, you know, requests a demo, uh, attends an event, like whatever it might be. And this obviously is, you know, so much of, you know, what the problems that we at Demand Base are, are trying to solve, um, you know, for uh, for go-to-market is around this anonymized buyer journey. Um, so not surprising when you consider so much more is controlled, um, you know, by the buyer. But also, if we look at the evolution of, you know, millennials are now more and more in, in, in you know, decision-making roles, like they're controlling budgets. And, you know, they grew up in the world of, of social media, of, um, you know, of Yelp, of, uh, you know, a glass door of all of these review sites. And uh, actually, I was at a conference last year, uh, a WPP conference where uh, WaveMaker, one of the B2B agencies with a WPP, shared some data that said 87% of millennial buyers will say that a trusted contact or former colleague's recommendation is going to be by far the most important factor when they come to a buying decision. Um, so it's something we all need to understand, adopt and lean into and maybe make more programmatic as well. But um, it's not surprising. And I think when you can stand by the quality of your customer relationships, when you can stand by the quality of your technology and the problems that you're solving, you should be very confident, confident in your ability to partner with B2B influencers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, back in the day before there was this concept of sort of social media influencers, same human behavior, right? Third-party influence. I'm going to go check reviews on Trust Radius or on G2 or Gartner or wherever, I'm going to go check out these peer reviews, which is essentially somebody who's used the product, who's not being paid to use the product, is going to tell me whether they liked it or not, or what their sort of true um, perspective is, not as a marketer, but as a as an authentic kind of human that you trust. Um, and then I think those, and I think those are still super powerful, obviously, specifically in the mid-market and enterprise. But there was also kind of the concern of like, is it pay to play? Is it not? Like, what's sort of the mindset around some of those third-party reviews? but real humans who are authentically kind of endorsing the product. And like you said, if you stand on a great product um, and can believe in that, um, I think it's pretty powerful. I mean, even my son, my son is a, uh, is a junior in high school. Uh, he's a football player. It's game night. That explains why I'm like sort of, you know, all in my football gear, we're playing our biggest rival. It's the number six game in the country this week. 
Um, yeah, it's like Travis versus Westlake. Very exciting. Uh, but anyways, but even he, like as as a uh, running back on the football team, like gets reached out to by like drip companies, like people who do like um, like drip for like, you know, what people wear. They wear all stuff on their arms and their legs and whatever face stuff and whatever. Um, but they reach out and they say, hey, can you post our stuff on your on your Instagram or whatever? Because, you know, and that's like a 16 year old high school football player. Like, so, you know, like multiply that times a thousand, you get up into the real world um, of B2B influence. It's pretty powerful. So it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. And if it really does hit these numbers, what it was, you said, what, 24 by 24 billion is, is a number that, that we saw. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And I saw like uh, 52 billion four years from now. Like that's massive. That's his, I mean, you know, that's, it's a small country right there which is pretty cool. So, well, cool. What is, what was from the overall report? And well, by the way, for folks who are listening, the, uh, the link to the report will be in the show notes. Um, so if you want to download that report, it'll be on demandbase.com, but you can get the specific link out of the show notes. What was one piece of data, Gareth, from the report that you found overall just the most interesting? So something that surprised me, Kelly, was that only 57% of respondents said that they're using an account-based strategy for their top of funnel advertising. And, you know, I think this speaks to the, uh, you know, the ongoing brand to demand or brand versus demand conversation where, you know, when it comes to demand gen, account based, et cetera, people really, you know, the the evolution of, of ABX as a, a strategy and approach, I think, you know, we firmly sort of shifted that into um, it being very much the centerpiece of, of a demand gen strategy. Um, so it interests me sometimes to see how at the brand level, and especially when you look at large global enterprises, you know, the proportion of budget that's going on brand advertising tends to dwarf like the account based uh, in most cases. But, you know, we will always be an advocate for at least some of your brand budget going to maybe an expanded version of your target account list. But you shouldn't really be wasting budget on companies or individuals from companies that are never going to buy from you. Uh, and I think this is where the evolution of Connecti TV in a B2B context is especially interesting. Um, because, you know, it's not just a brand play. You can also complement your mid and lower funnel campaigns. I mean, in the end of the day, you're targeting the same individual from the same accounts. And the fact that, you know, without getting too into the weeds, IP address is a consistent targeting component in a set-top box, uh, potentially to, you know, somebody's web activity means you really can get quite granular. But just the, the impact that we have seen with B2B campaigns on, on connected TV um, the level of engagement, so like bear in mind, there's no click in connected TV, but the visits data is extremely high. And so it just shows the impact of that site sound and motion in a brand in a lower form of context too, but especially in a brand context. And so it's, it's a number I'm going to be interested to keep an eye on and see if it shifts uh, with the report next year. Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the days, you know, like as a marketer, right, I started my marketing career, like in, in the early 2000s. And there, I remember I was working uh, at Kraft Foods and so consumer, but it was very much a TV print magazine kind of thing. And they'd come and pitch us digital and we would laugh and say, we're not going to waste our money on digital. No one's using digital. Um, it's not funny. Now everything has shifted to digital. But the idea also was still, we're running these big brand campaigns and we're running them as sort of just awareness building, fix, you know, like keep the base up on the business. It wasn't considered transactional. It was really this advertising play, but not really measurable other than maybe impressions. Now with, you know, with what we say brand and you're talking about account-based top of funnel advertising, you really can connect all those dots because you're seeing the view through of who saw the ads. You're seeing the connection down to how did that influence their next action? How did that influence where they came to the site, engaged in a webinar, attended an event, whatever they did after that, that allowed our sellers to be able to say, ooh, like there's a, there's somebody who's in the market, like let's go help them out um, and service those customers. And so this thing that where brand used to feel expensive and immeasurable is now, especially through this account base, like that's why 57% feels low to me. Cause I'm like, man, you can finally justify your brand spin because you can connect all the dots um, together and actually uh, prove the ROI on that investment, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, I do think we are going to see that that gap narrow, um, you know, look in terms of um, branded plays on, on paid search, et cetera. That's always going to be extremely important, but there is definitely more of a role for account based. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. We have gotten into the weeds of this report. I hope everyone is intrigued and wants to read the report now because it will um, definitely shine a light on the opportunities ahead and how you stay ahead of advertising trends. So I encourage you to all check that out. Again, the link is in the show notes. Gareth, as we start to wrap up, a couple things. 
one, um, what is your biggest piece of advice for aspiring CMOs, who is the majority of our audience or existing CMOs, who want to turn this into something actionable or just advice for them in general? In life, it's up to you. So I think the the trend of CMO as technologists obviously has been an extremely prominent one in recent years, and that's only going to increase, you know, with um, with the evolution of AI. So you know, really having trusted internal and external resources that can guide you on the available technologies, one, but more importantly, uh, you know, how to deploy them uh, most effectively, I think, is absolutely key. And then, you know, just generally understanding like what's a B2B tool versus a, a B2C tool and, you know, bringing the, the, the you know, not a phrase that we use sometimes is don't bring B2C tech to a B2B fight. And I think that's an important point that we always try to reiterate. But, um, you know, as a, as a multi-time successful CMO, Kelly, I'm interested, you know, in the advice that, that you would give. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think the, the biggest thing is that there's not a one size fits all for marketing, for advertising, um, even, right? I don't think that any one tactic alone is the end all be all. It's being able, as we talked about, being able to really connect that all together. So obviously like I'm a big fan that now we can do account based at scale. So I think that the quicker, you know, marketing leaders can come to terms with the effectiveness and efficiency and impact of moving to an account based model is is super powerful. And that's not me wearing my demand based CMO hat. That's wearing my like 20 years working in the industry hat of I've just seen the inefficiencies of kind of spray and pray versus a really targeted account-based strategy. That obviously means you need to know your ICP. That obviously means you need to know exactly the type of accounts you're going after. But when you know that and you can read those signals, you can be so much more impactful across the board. So when I say one size, one that doesn't, not one size fits all, I'm thinking, yes, we need to do top of funnel, but yes, we need to do middle of funnel. Yes, we need to do conversion tactics. Yes, we need to host events. Yes, we need to deliver content. There's all the things. It's a full connected 360 um, on those those plays. And so I think all of them kind of work, make everything else work harder. And so as my advice to actual marketers in their career relative to that is to get as many cross-functional lateral experiences in the marketing world as possible. And I really encourage, I mean, I don't know if we, who all is listening or at what level exactly, but pre-director, I feel like is the best opportunity to where, you know, if you come in and you come in as a copywriter and then you're a content marketer and a content strategist and you become a director of content, you can become typecast as content, which is great if that's what you love. But if you want to be sort of a well-rounded future CMO, I think it's, it's jumping over and getting experience running digital media, running advertising, running ABM, running field marketing, doing product marketing, any of those things that are going to make you a better marketing leader. They're going to make you do better messaging in your advertising. They're going to make you do better execution and better connection and not do kind of a siloed look at marketing. Um, so career perspective, that's what I advise. And then on the execution, I think the the 360 well-rounded is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I guess in terms of something that aspiring CMOs could do today, it's read the report. Read the report. That's great advice. One more thing. I'm going to totally put you on the spot. What is one fun fact about Gareth Noonan that maybe people don't know about you? Oh, wow. So one I share sometimes is that I was the fifth generation of my family to work for Guinness. So oh, yeah, a lot wow. of uh, speaking of marketing, incredible brand equity there. And yes. uh, speaking personally, a lot of brand loyalty. Oh, very cool. So what did you do at Guinness? Because I assume, you know, obviously we've got some Irish roots. If anybody's heard the, the accent, I think. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, so tell me about what did you do for Guinness or what did your family do? What was the history there? My father started working there when he was 14, started washing bottles and uh, retired as a sales manager. Uh, my grandfather was a porter in the, the medical center. So Guinness was a Quaker company. So in the 19th century, they provided housing, health care, et cetera, to their employees, really looked after them very well. And then what I did was um, I was an intern in finance. But um, I will say it felt like going to Willy Wonka's factory every day. It was a great job. Oh, that's very cool. Was that your first job? Other than casual summer jobs. Yeah. 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 Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I did not know that about you. That's a fun fact. Thank you for sharing. Um, and with that, we will wrap it up. Gareth, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate uh, your insights and all the things you're doing, obviously, to drive the advertising business at Demandbase. Great. Thanks, Kelly. And go Travis. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining on the Next Gen CMO podcast. Uh, definitely check out the show notes to get the report. And we will see you all next time. Thanks. Thanks.